1984, the late 1980s, I was somewhere in the Canary Islands, I think, having big arguments about this. This was quite exciting and new. It's now a long time ago. And it seems to me not to be quite so radical now. Um, since, after all, you know, if, you're, if I go back and read Eugene Nider, he was talking about equivalence, but he was seriously aware of different audiences and the need to adapt to different audiences. And I think he was saying something about purpose without the term. If you go back and read the old text, you know, the break isn't so radical, but the metalinguistic break, the meta language is the language we use to talk about language. The language we use to talk about translation became quite different. Now here is why I have problems with this paradigm. I've told you what it is. You're all convinced it's a great theory. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to just suggest some shortcomings for me and try to attach it to, uh, to my concern. What is a purpose? I mean, nobody ever gave me a catalogue of purposes. I mean, you know, all these books and books on the scopos, the instructions, and, you know, whatever anybody said, that could be a purpose. If I look in the real world and I see what clients tell translators, it's usually nothing. It's very hard to get a client, you know, what kind of function, what kind of equivalence do you want? What's the scopos? What, you know, just translate the text. At best, you find people saying, oh, it's for publication. Or it's not for publication, it's just for gist, you know. But this is not purpose, this is a, a level of quality that's required. I don't think quality is the same thing as purpose. Sometimes we do get people saying, ah, it's for a specialized distribution or for general distribution. A medical text can be translated for doctors or for the general public. Okay? Um, if you're selling a drug or writing up the, the publicity for a drug, you will do one text for the medical profession and then another text for a television commercial and they, 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 they won't be the same things. But that's pretty broad and general, isn't it? And it's not particularly intellectual. To that's about as far as the paradigm actually gets to industrial practice, in my limited experience. My general experience is, translate the text. Why don't clients tell us how to translate the text? Because A, they don't know, and B, they don't care. <laughs> and, you know, and people in this paradigm will say, well, therefore we now have to educate the clients. Hey, no, they just want a translation. I'm going to suggest that there's a more primitive, intuitive logic at work behind this fact, well, let's suppose it's a fact, that clients don't specify the purpose. And the first reason is this, that in your communication with your client, you do all the stuff that Guadec had listed there, and you present an invoice, that daughter. Yeah, your list of things that you're charging for, and if you just put translation, $850, they'll pay, I hope if you're lucky, they'll pay $850 and that's it. It's not something they have to think about commercially, and most of our clients are commercial. Ah, Bardek has a good trick here. He suggests that we present an invoice with everything that a translator can do. You know, ask your client, uh, what quality would you like? Uh, every client will say, top quality, of course. Give me the best quality. You say, ah, good. Then I put in a surcharge for double revision. Ah, no, wait a minute. It's not that, you know, it's just, it's just for publication in the, amongst a few friends or something. Ah, oh, it's a single revision. Then that's a 5% you know, surcharge, double revision 15%. Uh, do you want an external revisor to go over it? Do you want an area expert to go over it? You can add those things on. 
my consultation fee for telling you how best to approach the, the foreign client or the foreign readership could be in there as well. If it were in our invoices, our clients would be very aware of the different criteria that we subsume under the notion of purpose. We don't, therefore it's not generally an issue. But there's something else as well. I get back to my thing about orality versus writtenness. To what I was looking at last week. And here it should be clear, I'm not talking so much about the actual fact of writing as I'm talking about writtenness in language. You know, when you're in court and a judge reads out a sentence and it's very formal and elaborate and incomprehensible to the accused. Somebody, an Italian girl was telling me about this today in Italy. The Italian legal language is incredibly full of arabesques, very, very ornate, okay? And you've got these illegal immigrants who are being deported. The judge reads out the sentence for about five minutes, and the interpreter translates it as that, meaning you can go. <laughs> There's no way that the accused was going to understand what's in that sentence. The interpreter's one thing was, you know, you're off, you're out, you can go. Okay. Um, that would be written communication, even though it's spoken. It has a high degree of writtenness about it. Okay? And, and in a novel, if you're reading Steinbeck, Canary Row, you'll find wonderful passages of dialogue. Actually, not many, but some passages of dialogue. Uh, it's spoken language, but it's written. Okay? So um, we're not fixed to the actual fact. We're talking about different kinds of language use, in fact. In a hospital, if the interpreter's there and we have to get people to understand what's happening, it's highly spoken, even when there are technical terms, the technical terms have to be explained, and dynamic equivalence and adaptation, everything can happen, and the interpreter can add things that the, the doctor doesn't say, to that extent, produce a new text, as, as Holtz-Mentor would have us do, or ask the doctor to explain, intervene and say, please explain it better. <laughs> Whereas in court, except for Italian courts, as I've just learned, uh, interpreters generally are required to be far more faithful, follow the source text far more faithfully, because they're being controlled, at least with respect to length. If you did that in California, just translate it. I love that gesture. That doesn't work in, I think it works in Italian and, and, and Spanish. I don't know. That means go. Um, it wouldn't work in California, because they're there far more controlled profession. Why is it that the same text can be rendered in different ways in different situations? And my proposal is that the situations are different because the balance of orality and writtenness is different in the situation. Maybe in the source text as well, but also in the general situation, in the communicative situation, in which you're going to work. Where you have a sender and a receiver, several receivers, and somebody controlling you, and somebody paying you. The writtenness or the orality of the language being used will signal something about your purpose. Also, about what you have to do to get paid correctly, which is perhaps your individual purpose, uh, that for me I didn't talk about enough. And the strange thing about this is that for everybody in that situation, it's remarkably clear. If in the medical encounter in the hospital, the interpreter asks for explanations or gives added explanations, nobody is particularly upset. If they do that in, the, in court, then it's rather more difficult. It can be done, but it's rather uh, going against the norms of that situation. Same thing for the Bible example that I gave before. It's just an obvious to all. In this, I move to a wider question, which is where the reflection leads me to what? If you ask about what's the purpose of a translation, well, what 
what's the purpose of a communicative situation? You get to sort of questions like, what's the purpose of language? One of the things that people in pragmatics uh, are fascinated with is the simple question, why do we talk so much? Why are people talking all the time? What's the purpose in it? You know, you sit down and, and you want to have a chat and have a talk and, and talk about the weather or exchanging your... The traditional theory of language was that language is there to exchange information. It's the buffalo is down by the lake theory. The men are out hunting, they have to coordinate their actions, they want to know where the buffaloes are, you develop language to tell the other men, it's a masculine, macho theory, this one, here's the information, the buffaloes are down by the lake. Is that the correct information? Yes, it's the correct information, let's go kill them. Right. End of language use. And admittedly, men sort of believe in that. You know, if I'm not going to get useful information, what the hell am I going to talk about this? Why would you have a conversation? And I'm glad the men recognize themselves in that. <laughs> and a lot of the, the theories we have are based on that, on, on accumulating useful information. Uh, what's called relevance theory, if, you, if you're up to speed on that, uh, does say, you know, Language is there for people to get the information they need in order to organize their lives. All right, but how much information do you really need? There's another theory of language by a, a zoologist called Robin Dunbar. And it's a nice little book. It's called Grooming and the Origin of Language, I think. And he goes back and he looks at the development of humankind from apes. And he observes that in a certain stage, chimpanzees, the activity of grooming comes in. Grooming, I was going to say it's when you get your hair to look nice, but I don't do a lot of that these days. <laughs> uh, it's not when people look after themselves, it's when they look after others. So you'll find in chimpanzees uh, that they'll spend, and higher apes, uh, gorillas, uh, orangutans especially, they'll spend a long time, hours and hours and hours, going over each, the other person's fur and picking out all the, the burrs and the prickles and the grass and bits and pieces. Just looking after them and saying things, making sounds as they do. Looking after each other. And Dunbar says, well, where does language come from? From these people hunting? He says, no, language is the development of that. Of making sounds while we look after each other to build up the bonds, which become effective bonds of self-protection, of mutual protection, in fact. That when one is attacked, the other will come to the aid because they have this bond which has been built up through grooming, looking, spending time looking after each other. So when I look at women talking so much, I don't know. And I wonder, what, what are they doing this for? What the earthly information could you possibly need out of all this talk as you're going to do as soon as you leave here? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, didn't like the talk today. No, I didn't know, but still, you know, what are you going to... You don't need the information. You're using language to build up effective bonds, to build up a society, in fact, where people will look after each other when need be. And that is, for Dunbar, one of the great functions of language. That our languages, all of our languages, have part of it, which is used for exchanging information, official information, written information. In social linguistics, these are H varieties. Official, written varieties of language. The standard language. The one you have to go to school to learn. And they always exist. This is your language. And they always exist in parallel with L varieties. The spoken language, the, you know, the kinds that you use for chatting at the bus stop, the kinds you use for polite conversation, the kinds you use in the family, the kinds you use for declaring your love or your hatred or your indifference to your fellow companions. 
all of our languages have these two. In fact, uh, a colleague of mine in, in Spain, Joaquin Mayafre, wrote, wrote a book on this. He's a great translator. And he said he translated Joyce. And he said, look, I'm translating Joyce and, and I can see two things happening here. There's the official language of the polis, of the city, of, of, of things that have to be done. It's the English bit of Joyce, the uh, colonized island, if you like. And opposed to that, we find all the nursery rhymes, all the jokes, all the sayings, all the proverbs, this wealth of culture that's in the same book. And I have to translate one kind of language. It goes from English to Catalan. Look for the language of the polis there, the language there, the language of the tribe there, the language there. I'm saying the writtenness is there and the spokenness is there as well. They are mixed. I, I could even take that back to classical or neoclassical French theory of when they said, well, what is the purpose of literature? And traditionally, the purpose of good literature in the French neoclassicism was to delight and to instruct at the same time. Uh, I'm suggesting here that the purpose of language is to instruct. It is rhythmless variants and to delight. It is more spoken variants. <coughs> My proposition to close is that our translation situations are characterized, whether we like it or not, by different mixes of orality and writtenness, and this is intuitively shared by all this common knowledge, that if you can get those mixes and judge them, it's pretty clear what the purpose of language is. How much is there to instruct and how much of it is there to delight or build up bonds of solidarity. And that if you can grasp those purposes, as we tend to do, you understand intuitively how to translate it.